Professor Vitt. Welcome to the mock exam. Any question that is on the mock exam is fair game for your exam. So if you understand everything that we're talking about in this video, uh, you'll be in good shape for the mock exam to take on the LMS. So I'm going to go ahead and start from the beginning. The first section that we start with is true, false, and multiple choice. But we're going to have a couple of um, interruptions for that. Uh, so in other words, we're going to jump to short answer and then jump back to passage identification and, and so forth. So there'll be a little bit of jumping around here. All right. So first up, um, this is a true false question. Um, so I'm combining true false and multiple choice. Uh, in this case, you'll know the difference because um, there won't be any uh, multiple choice and any sort of selections, right? So um, here we go. Existentialists can only be atheists. Okay, is that true or false? Stop and ask yourself for a second. You should immediately recognize that that's false, right? Existentialists can be both atheists and theists, and we've studied atheistic thinkers and theistic thinkers under that rubric. So the first one is false. Now, if you don't know what an atheist is and you don't know what a theist is, it's going to be hard to answer that question. So go back into your notes, look it up, and find out for sure. Knowing the answer alone doesn't help you. You have to understand why the, the answer is true or false. All right. Number two, uh, if someone is a theist, then it is impossible for them to be anything <clears throat> but an existentialist. This statement is false. There are lots of theists who are not existentialists. <clears throat> and so um, that does not make sense, right? So existentialism is, existentialism is a small subset of thinkers. And you can be a theist and not be an existentialist. Uh, in fact, many, 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 many theists are not existentialists. All right. Number three, an unconscious aesthete is someone like Ray from The Last Jedi. This is because Ray refuses to accept that straw would make a suitable structure for a house. She knows that a wolf could just blow the structure away with a huff and a puff. Okay, that statement is false. It's a distractor, right? Now, even though I put in distractors like that for folks, people do occasionally still miss them. Why? Well, they don't read the entire question or they get confused by the presence of language that looks like it makes sense, looks like it's something intelligible and interesting, but it's not. <clears throat> Number four, atheistic existentialists like Sartre tend to think that existence precedes essence, Whereas theistic existentialists may not think that way, but they deal with a number of similar themes such as authenticity, angst, despair, etc. Um, this sentence is true. And it turns out that what defines an existentialist is not a set of necessary and sufficient conditions, right? But a tendency to deal with certain themes, right? So authenticity, leaving, leading an authentic life. This is important to both Sartre and to Kierkegaard. And so you can see how it can be approached from radically different perspectives. Um, all right, number five. A hedonistic aesthete is someone who chases pleasure after pleasure. They lack a stable identity and refuse to commit. That's absolutely true, right? For, for Kierkegaard, a hedonistic aesthete is someone who is chasing pleasure after pleasure. They might have a little more self-knowledge than an unconscious aesthete, but they, but they both lack a stable identity and they refuse to commit to a project, namely themselves. So, so that would be correct. Okay, number six, according to Judith Barad, Roy Batty overcomes his essence when he saves Deckard. Uh, that would be true, right? That would be true. Um, this just comes from the article. Remember, this is when she thinks that Roy Batty really does overcome his essence, where his essence is understood as combat to kill, right? And so ultimately, Roy becomes life affirming instead of life denying. And that is something that is not in his programming. And so he exceeds his essence. All right. Number seven, according to Judith Broad, Deckard overcomes his essence when he tries potato salad for the first time. That's false. That's false, right? Uh, there is no potato salad, to my knowledge, in Blade Runner. It's a distractor. Number eight, a, res a reflective aesthete. I should probably just make this 
part of the... A, res, a reflective aesthete is, is a someone who spends time thinking about possibilities in the world. They might think about winning the lottery, becoming a certain profession, etc. What is most distinctive about them is that they're lost in the possibilities of the world. That's true, right? So very often reflective aesthetes will avoid doing things in the world so that they can maintain their stranglehold on all the possibilities uh, for their lives. Um, they become drunk on the reflection of the world instead of the world itself. Number nine. According to Satwa, there are lots of vouchsafe signs that guarantee humans' orientation on the earth. Okay, so this comes from existentialism as a humanism, and the answer to this is no, right? This is part of what is so difficult about um, certain existentialist thinkers. They think, look, you're never going to get rid of that little bit of mystery. Uh, it turns out you could be wrong, right? And we'll see this much later whenever we discuss Abraham and Isaac, um, for Satra. Look, um, suppose, you know, the, the thinking for Satra goes something like this. Suppose you wake up in the morning and God says to you, uh, your goal in life, your, your, your life's goal is to serve in the church, right? Um, and Satra would react to that by saying, well, how do I know that's God's voice? At some point I have to decide, look, I could be wrong, but I'm going to assume that this is God's voice and I'm going to go for it, right? You never quite reduce the mystery in the world. You can never be completely sure that what you're doing is the right thing. And that causes in you a profound amount of angst, a sort of unsettledness that, oh my gosh, this could all be wrong. You can see this reflected in Blade Runner, of course. Is Deckard a replicant or not? He's not sure, right? There's this sort of could be, couldn't be that you can never quite get rid of. You can't purge yourself with certainty. You're going to have to eventually make a decision and stick with it. All right. Number 10. Hannah Arendt and Zoran Kierkegaard both think the newspaper is a great thing. Okay. The answer to this is false. Remember, Kierkegaard doesn't like the newspaper. He thinks that it's a bad thing. Hannah Arendt thinks that it's a great thing. Now, um, they're both talking about the newspaper, but to be more specific, um, Hannah Arendt was talking about freedom of the press, right? And so that, but ultimately it doesn't matter. This, this answer here is false. Okay. Number 11, this is a multiple choice question. When you take a multiple choice question, what I encourage you guys to do is to try and uh, try to eliminate, excuse me, it's Burt's beeswax. Um, try to eliminate the wrong answers first, right? So, um, we're going to try and eliminate the wrong answer first here on number 11. So let's just start reading them from the top. God as a crafter means, A, people exist before the idea of them exists. Thus, people are free to choose their essence when there is no vouchsafe. Okay, this is not talking about God at all. It's probably a distractor. Let's move on. We'll keep it up there, but let's move on. B, people exist before the idea of them exists. Thus, people are, okay, same thing, right? This is this isn't so far been an answer about God. It's talking about people. So let's let's keep moving on. C. God can be thought of as someone who as someone who designs and make things makes things like people. Okay. C isn't bad. It's the best one we've gotten so far. It's not perfect, but it's all right. So let's just hold on to C for a second. Let's check D. If D is kind of a a downer, then we'll move on uh, and pick C. D, God must be thought of as some kind of supernatural watchmaker. He's busy making a bunch of cool model watches like G-Shock and Rolex. Okay, D is obviously a distractor. There's some silliness in there. Your best answer here is going to be C, right? The idea of God as a crafter just means that you can think of God as someone who makes things, right? People and things, watches and buildings and things like that. Now, this may be a little misleading, right? Because... Really, when we talk about God as a crafter, we don't mean a crafter in the sense that he's putting together things that already exist. The notion of God, theologically, would be much more radical, right? God isn't putting things together like a watchmaker. God is creating the material from which you would make the watch. It's an even more radical thing. But generally speaking, what we mean is C. All right. Number 12. Existence precedes essence. And you know what, you guys? I, I should probably put little quotes up here for you just so that it's not uh, 
uh, that this is not um, totally incoherent. Okay, so number 12, existence precedes essence means. A, people exist before the idea of them exists. Thus, people are free to choose their essence when there's no vouchsafe, which will make numinal reality a tangible thing and not some overblown conceptual distractor. Mm, probably a distractor. There, it starts off pretty interestingly, but uh, this talk about numinal reality, we haven't seen that before. Let's just go tread lightly on that, right? B. People exist before the idea of them exists. Thus, people are free to choose their essence. When an individual commits an action, that person creates their essence by their choice. B is looking pretty good. But remember, it's multiple choice, so let's just make sure that C and D aren't something that we need to know. C, God can be thought of as someone who... Okay, wait, whoa, 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 I'm not, not... Number 12 isn't asking about God. It's asking about existence and essence, so let's move on. D, God must be... Same thing, same objection, right? C and D are talking about God. 12... It, it, it might relate to God, but the more straightforward answer there would be B, right? People exist before the idea of them exists. In other words, nobody's up there thinking about people. They're just made by the world. And once they're made, those people are free to define their essence by choosing it. That would be number 12. Okay, so number 12, looking good, is going to be B. The reason why A isn't good is because it's got some... Some language in there that's a distractor. It's actually from Kant, and we're not really talking about Kant, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. All right, number 13. This isn't something we've reviewed in class. Um, Sartre's discussion of Abraham and Isaac concludes that. So this is going to be very different from Kierkegaard's discussion of Abraham and Isaac, which was incredibly intense, right? So let's, let's just look at our options here. Um, a, man must make a leap of faith where he's giving up the earthly, embracing God, recognizing, wait a minute, wait, we're talking about all this. Ethics can be a drag, renouncing the worldly self, and believing six impossible things before breakfast. Who wrote that one? That's obviously somebody being silly. That's a quote from Alice in Wonderland, so that's not a good answer, right? Starts off nice, talking about a leap of faith. That's actually not Satwa. But if you don't know that and you're not familiar with it, then, yeah, you, you might pick it. Okay, B. There is no vouchsafe for man. How could Abraham possibly know that Tyrell made Rachel? Okay, B isn't, isn't totally wrong except this last part here about Tyrell and Rachel. Uh, Tyrell and Rachel have absolutely nothing to do with Satwa's discussion of Abraham and Isaac. So B is definitely a distractor. C, man must make a leap of faith where he's giving up the earthly, embracing God, recognizing ethics can be a temptation, renouncing the worldly self, and believing the impossible is a night of faith. Boy, those sounds like real good answers, but they don't sound like Satwa's discussion, right? Instead, that sounds a lot like Kierkegaard. D. There is no vouchsafe for man. How could Abraham possibly know that God was speaking to him and not an illusion? Okay, D is our best answer on this one. Just take a moment to recognize how different those thinkers are, right? Satwa is an atheist, so his burden for the existence of God is going to be much higher. He's going to need more pride, right? Because his priors are different. He's going to automatically have a desire, a, a greater bias against the position. And so naturally enough, he says, look, how, how could Abraham know that, that it was God talking to him, right? That's more fitting with his kind of atheistic worldview to be skeptical about that remark. Whereas when we look at Kierkegaard, that's I mean, he does, Kierkegaard does entertain this idea of, you know, the possibility of being wrong and stuff, but his focus on that discussion is totally different than, than Satwa's is, right? Um, in fact, Satwa is right here in C, right? The, and, and this is the backside of the Kierkegaard stages of life handout. These are the things that that flow from the discussion involving Abraham and Isaac, right? Um <clears throat> Abraham has to make this leap of faith. He has to, at some point, just decide to pick his horse, right? So <clears throat> he's going to give up earthly stuff. There's no way to justify what he's doing by appeal to anything in this world. He needs to embrace God and trust that this is what, that this is what God wants him to do, and he needs to do it. <clears throat> Recognizing ethics can be a temptation. In other words, ethics is really on Abraham's terms, not God's terms. Um, 
the next, renouncing the worldly self, right? He's, he's renouncing any sense to, to this decision and any attachment he has to the world. And then believing the impossible is a night of faith. He ultimately is going to believe that he will lose Abraham and God will give him back. He will unite the contradictory aspects of himself uh, before God. And that's what makes Abraham a knight of the faith. Okay, so that's number 14. Okay, 15. These are some short answers. We're going to jump to some multiple choice again down below, but just follow along in the doc. All right, um, number 15. Existentialists are both atheists and theists. How is this possible? What is an atheist? What is a theist? How is it that such different kinds of thinkers can both be considered existentialist? Be sure to use an example of each involving thinkers from this course. Okay, theists in a God, they usually believe in a God that has a certain number of traits. So that this God would be all loving, all powerful, all knowing. And I'm forgetting the fourth. I'm sure you're sitting at home watching it saying, this is what it is. But the idea is a theist believes in God and believes in a God that intervenes in one's everyday life. So a theist wouldn't think anything strange at all about the notion that um, God might have set up a situation in this person's life, a struggle or a challenge in order to test this person or bring them closer to God. Atheists, for purposes of our discussion so far, atheists are people who, who believe there is no God. They, they claim that there's no God. Um, and so what's strange is that you have thinkers of completely different varieties, right? It seems like a disagreement about the nature of God is as fundamental a disagreement as you can possibly have. And yet to have a, a, a number of thinkers who are considered one thing under both of these categories is very strange. Um, this is because being an existentialist isn't about meeting a certain list of conditions, Instead, being an existentialist thinker is to think about certain kinds of topics, whether or not your life is authentic, angst, dread, all of these fun things, right, are, are themes that dominate um, one's philosophical thought. And though your philosophical thought can look very different whether you are, whether you believe in a, a God or not. And so that's the answer. Right now, uh, so that's the general short answer, right? Last point here, be sure to use an example of each. Well, look, you've got Sartre, S-A-R-T-R-E, and Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard was the theist. Kierkegaard means, I, I'm pretty sure in Danish, means uh, church garden. So there you go. It's easy to remember. Church garden, Kierkegaard, boom, he believes in God. Sartre is more of an atheist, and so uh, he doesn't believe in God. But they're both existentialists. All right, number 16, what does God as a crafter mean? Look at your answer above. In what sense does this relate to Sartre's claim that existence precedes essence? Okay, so without God as a craft, so very, so we discussed 16 above. God as a crafter just means God is the entity that creates things, right? We can imagine just as someone makes a pot, God could make a planet, right? That's the analogy there. Now, the sense in which this applies to existence preceding essence is that, um, Without God there, you don't have an essence prior to your existence. There's no one up there to think about you and give you an essence. Instead, you are thrust in the world as a thing, and then the decisions and actions you make then determine your essence, not, not the other way around. So that is number 16. Okay, um, so number 17, what are two senses for the term subjectivism? The first term is this idea that comes from uh, just a notion of choice, right? So if, if somebody says to me, what's better, chocolate or vanilla? I can say, well, that's subjective, right? It depends on the individual, right? And so very often um, when Satwa is discussing this, he says a lot of people think of existentialism is just a form of subjectivism, right? Is something right or wrong? Well, it just depends on what that existentialist thinks, right? Um, Kierkegaard, or excuse me, Sartre says, that's that's not the sense in which I, I use the term. There, there's another sense in which the term is more um, illustrative or more meaningful for an existentialist, and that's this notion that you are locked in your own 
perspective of the world and you cannot get outside of that perspective of the world in order to talk about it. So um, we didn't talk about this too much in class because it'll, it'll come up a little bit more with Nietzsche and perspectivism. But it's this idea that there, there may very well be an objective world out there, but the problem is I can never get out of my own subjective version of it to get to the world. Something like that. Um, okay, number 18. Sartre claims that neither will an existentialist think that a man can find help through some sign being vouchsafed upon earth for his orientation, for he thinks that the man himself interprets the sign as he chooses. What does he mean? Kierkegaard here is try. excuse me, Sartre here, I've got two, a 50-50 shot, right? Um, he's trying to say, look, there, there's no sense in which you are free from interpreting the world. In order to interact with the world, you have to interpret it in some way. And so suppose, using the Abraham and Isaac example, uh, someone says, well, God is talking to me. Satra's response is going to say, how do you know? How do you know? Well, you're interpreting this. Somebody says, well, God is talking to me. They say, okay, well, he, he would then say that you are interpreting that voice as God's voice, right? And how could you know? And couldn't it otherwise be someone's voice who sounds like God or something like that? Now, um, for for Sartre, this is important because he says, look, eventually there there is your kind of, I think his main point here is this. Look, eventually it comes down to you and what you decide and how you decide to interpret things. There is no sense in which um, your life is given an um, unequivocally certain meaning, right? That eventually you're going to have to interpret something, even if it's scripture or a command from God, as being correct, as being veridical. And he says, it comes down to choice, and you need to acknowledge that ultimately it comes down to a choice. So, so that's kind of the thrust of that um, passage. Now, by the way, uh, I know a number of religious people who would not agree with that, right? That they, there are Christians who say, for instance, that the word of God is communicated to them unequivocally and without, um, without any interpretation whatsoever. Um, that's fine. You know, absolutely, I understand your, your counter-argument there. It's, that's more of a debate. Here, we just want to get down, you know, what does Sartre think here? What is he trying to get across? All right. So we have some passages here. These are going to be very familiar to you uh, because they're going to be thrown from existentialism as a humanism. So this 1920 and 21 uh, and, uh, it, uh, and 22 are all from existentialism as a humanism. So let's, let's talk about this first one here. Um, number 19. The question is only complicated because there are two kinds of existentialists. Okay. Uh, there are the Christians, da, 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 and on the other existential atheists, among whom we play Heidegger, French existentialists, and myself. What do they have in common? Da, 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 da. Okay. This is Sartre. So you're identifying the author. And the main idea, he's saying, look, uh, you have, well, he says <laughs> pretty clearly, right? There are two kinds of existentialists, those who believe in God and those who don't. The end. That's number 19. All right. Um, number 20, the presence of such and such a paper knife or book is thus determined before my eyes. Here then we're viewing the world from a technical standpoint and we can say that production precedes essence. When we think of God as the creator, we are thinking of him most of the time as a super, uh, supernal artisan. All right. Um, what is he saying here? Hold on. I've got a little visitor. What's going on over there? You can come here quick. Oh, amazing. Come on in here. Hurry. Okay, you say hi to everybody. Hi. Okay. All right. What's your name? Owen. All right. Good. Hold on, buddy. All right. Here we are. Uh, number 20. The presence of such and such a paper knife or book is thus determined before my eyes. Okay. Um, this is Satra, and he's talking about the notion, uh, he's comparing objects that have been created, like scissors, that's what he means by a paper knife, or a pen or a book, right? That's determined by looking at what the person who invented the thing was intending that the thing was designed to do, right? Um, and so we can think of God in that way. God is sort of uh, 
coming up with our essence, what we're supposed to be doing, and then creating us and we go and do it. Um, that, that's really what he means there in 20. Okay, number 21. By its very disguise, his anguish reveals itself. This is the anguish that Kierkegaard called the anguish of Abraham. And then he talks about Abraham here, right? Uh, you know the story, an angel commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son and obedience was obligatory. If it really was an angel who had appeared and said, sacrifice your son, anyone in such a case would first wonder whether it was indeed an angel and secondly, uh, whether I'm really Abraham. Where are the proofs? A certain mad woman who suffered from hallucinations said that people were telephoning to her and giving her orders. The doctor asked, but who is it that speaks to you? She replied, he says it's God. And what indeed could prove to her that it was God? If an angel appears to me, what proof is it that it is an angel? Or if I hear voices, who can prove that they proceed from heaven and not from hell, or from my own subconscious, or some pathological condition? Who can prove that they are really addressed to me? Okay, this is a longer version of Satwa reacting to the Abraham and Isaac story, and Instead of um, sort of discussing the nature of Abraham's action before God, Satwa looks at this story very differently. And he says, you know, how do you know that, that you're Abraham or that this is God or that this is going on? How do we know it's not some, you know, organic pathology that's causing us to, to think this, right? Maybe we, are, we have some mental illness that causes us to think this way. That indecision, that indeterminacy, that not knowing that what you're interpreting, you're interpreting correctly, is anguish, right? You don't know for sure whether it's God. You have to make the leap of faith and say that it is and move forward. So that's what Satra is talking about there. Number 22. Um, now, this is a quote of Satra quoting Dostoevsky. And the quote is, if God did not exist, everything would be permitted. Um, now, we're going to talk about this a bit more, um, but this is Dostoevsky, who is quoting Satra. What does that mean? So the, the very idea kind of speaks for itself, right? The idea is something like, look, if, if God's not there, then nobody has a rule book, and you can just do whatever you want, right? There's nobody backing it up. So if somebody, if I go over to my neighbor's yard right now, and they yank out their flowers, right? Um, look, if there's no God, maybe, maybe that's just one thing after another, right? And it wouldn't make any difference whether I yanked their, their, their plants out or I drove my car on their lawn. Nobody's there to stop me. Of course it's permitted. And so this gives rise to a real concern that people have, which is if there is no God, how is it that certain actions can be prohibited and others, um, accepted or even um, sanctioned and, and championed, right? So these are deep questions about God and morality. So we're moving on now to the God and morality stuff. Let me click on this for you and it should bring it up. And if it doesn't, then I know it's all wrong. It's loading, it's loading, it's loading. Maybe I should let it load. I'm, I am really, really far away. So it's not gonna do it, is it? No. All right, I'm not on the extended Wi-Fi. Hold on just a second. All right, so we have our presentation opened up right here, and uh, we won't really need it for a number for for our very first question. Um, what is this argument attempting to show? The answer is super simple. It's right here in the conclusion. Thus, God exists. So this argument is attempting to show that God exists by virtue of appealing to uh, morality, essentially. Okay, what are two arguments, reasons, that someone might accept premise one as true? If God does not exist, then everything is permitted. So this, this premise had two support, two supporting arguments here. Uh, let's zoom through. Um, they were the gift from God argument and God as a lawgiver. So very roughly, they go something like this. Um, you might think that one is true, that if God does not exist, then everything is permitted, because you think of life itself as a gift from God. And um, this gift from God then um, instills in you a duty 
to do what it is you're supposed to do with this wonderful cherished gift, right? So that's, that's one argument. The second one for this same premise is the, um, let me just zoom back to it really quick. You see, I, I don't know if you can see it right here, but there's a gavel. And it's this idea of God as a lawgiver. And the story kind of goes, and I referred to it in a prior question. Um, the idea is that this is essentially, um, look, it's God's game. He brings the bat and the ball, and, and he's the one who lays down the rules, and we just play by the rules, right? Law uh, is prescribed by God, right? Thou shall not kill. And we all need to abide by that law, right? So there's this notion that um, God's existence then implies a set of moral prescriptions or moral um, uh, commands or suggestions that are obligatory to, to do. So that's one. Number B, or excuse me, letter B, what are two counter arguments to premise one? Okay, the, the counter arguments to this would be to essentially attack the arguments. So the first one with regard to the gift, um, you could argue as we did, and I'll, I'll leave it for your review, the notion of a gift in this sense, gift as existence would be incoherent, right? So that's one of the counter arguments. And the second one is to try and attack the analogy of God as a lawgiver. Um, that essentially there, there, there could be a requirement, but but just because there exists a requirement doesn't mean that there is a requirer, right? So look, it's a requirement that in order for my laptop to work, it's not wet, right? But there's no requirer. Steve Jobs or whomever it is isn't sitting there saying, look, we have a requirement now for this, right? It, it, it's obviously a requirement, but it's not like somebody's making that requirement. That That's the counter argument. I just want to point out, this is a a very surface view of incredibly complex questions. And so whatever side you find yourself on in these kinds of questions, you can dig deeper and find more, you know, enriching ways to, to engage with the material. Um, but we're just trying to give enough here to, to keep us moving forward with some existential themes. Okay, so that was number 23. Number 24, what is the name given to the position which holds this position is true? It should be that holds this claim or something like that, right? Um, something is right or wrong if and only if God commands it to be right or wrong. The, the answer for this one is divine command theory. Now, uh, there are different formulations of divine command theory, right? And, and I'm sure I could find a philosopher who would object to this formulation. But generally speaking, that's what it is, right? It's called divine command theory. And the idea is that something is right or wrong if it's commanded or prohibited or so forth by God. All right. Um, number 25, what is a problem presented in class with holding such a position? And this would then be Euthyphro's dilemma. Now, this was hard to, to reproduce. We didn't spend a lot of time on it. So I don't want anybody to be too worried about this question, but you should know the answer, right? And it goes something like this. Um, you try to set up an, uh, a dilemma. And uh, this comes from Socrates way back. And you try to argue from a starting position that God commands something, right? So God commands something and that then makes it right, right? That's one option. So you say, look, God commands something and his commanding it makes that thing right or wrong. Um, now, the problem with, with that is that it could be that God made different kinds of commands. And then it looks like God is just saying that something is right or wrong. Um, and he could do something really crazy like make rape right or make murder right or right. And that would just seem crazy to us. And, and you would have somebody say, you know, here's Professor Vint and he never killed anybody ever. Uh, and all of a sudden he decided to and he did a great job. You know, he killed an innocent person. I mean, that would sound crazy to us, right? That just seems repugnant to us. And so it looks like that side of the dilemma, this idea that God commanding something makes it right or wrong, doesn't quite work because we want to say that God would be perfectly rational, not arbitrary, and that he would have a reason for the things that he commands. Okay, the other half of this dilemma is that God 
um, command something because it is right or wrong. In other words, God is kind of a messenger and he knows what the right and wrong stuff is and he just commands or prohibits us from doing things accordingly, right? Now, the, the problem with this is it begins to run aground. Um, look, for instance, you might say, um, what standard would be external to God? I mean, how, how would that even make sense? What, what right and wrong would be outside of God? That, doesn't, that does not seem to hold for a lot of folks. There are other problems people have. They say something like, um, look, if there are standards that are external to God, then it seems to imply that he couldn't change those standards, and so you would be limiting God's omnipotence. This stuff is way out there, right? And I'm not giving you super detailed presentations of it. So be familiar with it, but you don't need to stay up late, you know, crushing yourself on that. Okay, the following questions are expressly drawn from lectures on Kierkegaard. Slides are available here. So here's the Kierkegaard stages of life slides. We will consult them as we need to. What are the three stages of life Kierkegaard discusses? Aesthetic, ethical, and religious. Aesthetic, ethical, and religious. All right. Give a brief description of each kind. Okay. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. Here we are. So you're going to zip through. Do, 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 do. And get to our three stages, aesthetic, ethical, and religious. All right. The aesthetic life is one that is inherently passive. Now, you can have different kinds of aesthetes. You can have unconscious aesthetes. You can have hedonistic aesthetes. Um, and then you describe the differences. Unconscious aesthetes are just that, right? They're people who are living life, um, but they're unaware of their own agency. And it's a life of endless masks. Gosh, when the goth stuff comes out, they want to be goths. And when that stuff is out, then they're going to be punk. And when they're done with punk, they're going to go back to being straight edge. And when they're done with straight edge, they're going to go be something else, right? It's just a series of facades for these people. And their core is ultimately empty, right? There's no I there. They're just passive receptacle entities. All right. Hedonistic aesthetes, they're a little more aware than your unconscious aesthetes, but their awareness only extends to the point at which they can enjoy pleasure. Um, these are folks who chase after pleasures, right? One after the other. Um, and they don't, they don't really seem to care. The problem with, with being um, a hedonistic aesthete is that eventually stuff gets boring, right? Okay. And then we had ethical. Let's see if we can zoom forward to the ethical. So here's some more stuff on, oh, I can't believe I forgot reflective aesthetes. Daydreamers, right? Reflective aesthetes are daydreamers. They're kind of lost in imagination. They might reimagine the past a hundred different ways every day. Um, and they, they will avoid making choices because they would rather have a plurality of possibilities, right? All right, now let's see if we can get to go through our rotations. Okay, the ethical life. The ethical life, and we didn't talk about this too much, um, but it's when you take your place in a larger social or moral structure. So this would probably be a religion, right? Christianity would work fine. Um, the idea is that this network of social and ethical norms and practices becomes your framework for interacting with the world. The ethical life... Um, has prescriptions for ways to act in different circumstances. And this is ultimately what will cause the ethical life to be um, unfulfilling and inauthentic. You'll have these prescriptions to be a good person or to do something, but ultimately, whatever those prescriptions are, you're going to fail at meeting them all the time, right? Nobody's perfect. And this will lead you ultimately to a state of profound frustration. You, you have a goal you can never meet. Um, and so the other concern with, with the ethical form of life is that it removes the individual. If you only become a series of, um, complying, uh, if, if all you do is comply with rules that are given to you, then you lose your individuality. That's a concern with the ethical life that ultimately, um, it will not be fulfilling for you because you've, you have no more agency. You are not making decisions anymore. Okay, and then lastly, there is the religious. Here we are. 
The religious form of life is the most is the highest form of life for Kierkegaard. Um, it's a it's a unified self between you and God. You you've presented yourself before God, and God has made you whole. He has united the contradictory aspects of yourself. Um, and it is the highest, most authentic form of life. It is also super tough to get there. Okay, um, so we did a, gave a brief description of each kind, so we covered number 26. Which of the three stages of life is the best, according to Kierkegaard? Okay, um, this would be the religious form of life. That's the best form of life. Um, what relationship does the self have to this stage? <sighs> That's an open-ended question and it's a little difficult to answer. But basically, the self in this stage is a series of contradictions which are held together not by the individual but by God. That's the, that's the postcard. That's the way that it goes, right? It, people can't maintain this kind of duality between being a finite creature uh, existing in time and space. And by that, I mean a creature that has a stop and a start, right? So I had a start date, July, whenever, right? Back in the seventies. And I will have an end date eventually, many, many years from now, I'm sure. And that's a finite period of time. But remember, the self is also infinite for Kierkegaard. It's a non-physical substance. It's a soul that can exist in all of eternity. And so the idea here is that I can't, I can't hold these two parts of myself together. I need God to do it and help me do it, right? God needs to effectively do it for me as I try to do it, something like that. Okay. What is field rotation? What is crop rotation? Let's go back to our answers here. Let's go back to the stages of life. Boop, 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 boop. Here we are. All right. Field rotation is cycling through more and more different kinds of entertainment, right? Whereas crop rotation is sort of thinking about the possibilities of the world and withdrawing from the world into those possibilities. So you just have to memorize it brute force memorization. So we did 28 and 29. Oh, provide an example. Cycling through faster, more frequent, and more intense forms of entertainment. The field rotation, a good example of this would be one of your daredevil friends, right? So in high school, I had a friend like this, and it was always about bungee jumping and jumping out of planes and racing cars and doing all this stuff, right? And everything had to be bigger, better, and crazy, more crazy than it was before. That would be field rotation. Crop rotation is somebody who is just lost in the daydreams of the world. So you could come up with anyone you want for that. Um, uh, but, but the idea here is somebody is just living in a fantasy, right? They have no real understanding of what, of what the world is like. They're not interacting with the world in any meaningful way, certainly not any authentic way. Number 30, Kierkegaard remarks that he thinks it's easier to become a Christian if you're not already a Christian. What does he mean? This is a tough one. Um, in order to answer this question, you have to understand that Kierkegaard was not fond of the Christianity he encountered on a day-to-day -day basis in Copenhagen. He felt that people who were Christians had sort of lucked into it, and it wasn't enough for him to be born a Christian, right? That wouldn't ensure uh, a good life or a meaningful life or an authentic one. Instead, you had to really understand the nature of salvation, right? As one of fear and trembling before God. You, you had to stand in front of God very humbly. And Kierkegaard thinks that it's, it's harder to become a Christian if you're already a Christian, um, at least in part because if you know what the truth is, you stop looking for it. And so these folks think that they have found the truth. They think that they have found salvation. They think that they have found uh, life's meaning in God. But from Kierkegaard's lights, they're farther away than ever, right? And they might stay that way because they think that their very, very surface, very juvenile form of Christianity for him, right? This is for Kierkegaard, um, is itself not sufficient for salvation. Okay, so uh, that is number 30. All right. Um, number 31. What facts about Kierkegaard's life influenced his thought? There are lots of them. The first thing, 
the fact of his health, right? Kierkegaard was an a he was not in very good health. This restricted his movements and it restricted the extent to which he could participate in a normal, meaningful life, right? He had physical dis um, disabilities. And so even as a child, right, when he was sick or unable to move very well, his father would, would introduce him to uh, all sorts of places in the world by pretending to take a walk there. And so you can already see this notion of an aesthete who thinks about possibilities alone, right, starting to creep up into his life. Also, his father's attitude towards religion, in particular his father's condemnation of God at a young age, played a huge role in Kierkegaard's life because um, Kierkegaard's dad always felt like God was punishing him for that, that he was going to be punished for that. And that notion of God as, um, I, I don't want to say immoral or amoral, but God minus the normal moral attributes that we give to him, right? The, or, or maybe instead of thinking of God as a vengeful God, really affected the way that Kierkegaard thought of ethics. And you can see it ultimately in Abraham and Isaac, right? So his father's theology was a huge part of what he did. Um, there are other things we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about Kierkegaard's engagement. Um, you could discuss that um, if you know about it. If you don't, don't worry about it. I think the other thing that influenced Kierkegaard's life was his profound isolation. He stayed in the same place his entire life. And so he became very accustomed to a kind of fake form of, of living, right? A very inauthentic way of life in Copenhagen. And, and it distressed him and it worried him to such an extent that he really wanted to pull folks out of it. Okay, um, so those are some general lines on... Oh, uh, we could go even deeper, by the way. The one, um, the very, the one semester that Kierkegaard stayed away from home, right, where he got came in third in the class and so forth. Um, he took a course from Schiller, and Schiller was very anti-Hegel, and then you can see that come up in Kierkegaard's thought. Hegel believed in some kind of collective rational spirit, kind of moving through the world and moving the human race towards a, an apex of some kind, some kind of greatness. And he disregarded the role of the individual in this. Uh, remember, we talked about Hegel going to see a battle. And he goes to see this battle, and he just sees thousands of people being slaughtered, right, on each side. And the conclusion is, you know, no individual really matters that much. You know, when you look at a freeway, and you see a bunch of cars, and you think, oh yeah, each one of those is a person. And then you see miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of roads all filled with people it, it's hard to escape the conclusion that any one of those people in any one of those cars is really that important right and so these are things that Kierkegaard was exposed to by Schiller at uh, Schiller and Schiller uh, objected to them. He didn't think that they were correct. And so you can see Kierkegaard actually reacting against Hegel and saying, no, 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 the individual is important. And remember, for Kierkegaard, the reason why the individual is important is because that's how life is led, right? That's how you actually live life. And so you can see that much, much, much later when Satwa is talking about subjectivism, right? That there's just some sense in which you are living life inside of your head in a certain way. Okay, all right, uh, let's go on to passage identification. How close are we? Oh, we only have two left. I can't believe you're still with me. Thank you if you are. Okay, um, here we go. Kierkegaard is the author and explain the main idea. And so I begin with the principle that all men are bores. Surely no one will prove himself so great as a bore to, as to contradict me in this. Boredom is the root of all evil. Strange that boredom in itself, so staid and solid, should have such power to set in motion. Okay, um, Kierkegaard is, is playing a character here, and he's pretending to be an aesthete, and he's being a hedonistic aesthete. He's being the kind of person who is only seeking entertainment. And so you can see an aesthete can be very bright, an aesthete can be very funny. I actually think this is a hilarious line, right? I think this passage is hilarious. 
but there's no drive there. There's no willingness to commit to a stable identity over time. Instead, life is diversion and amusement. And that just seems like such a waste, right? You're spending your life trying to not be bored. Well, that just seems awful, right? You shouldn't be so passive. You should be out there doing something that's fulfilling, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, very similar. Let us place boxes everywhere, not as a present for the deposit of money, but for the free distribution of money. Everything would become gratis. Theaters gratis, be buried gratis. One's eulogy would be gratis. No one should be permitted to own any property. Okay, um, again, these are the musings of an aesthete, um, a reflective aesthete who has virtually nothing to say because they've failed to commit in any meaningful way with the world, right? All they can do is muse as to what might be an interesting way for them to spend their time, right? Now, I guess I would just go through, I would just spend a lot of money. That's how I would make my time, right? Not paint, not write, not listen to music, not read a book. It would just be somehow to acquire a possession that would allow someone to acquire a lot of other possessions, um, which is itself kind of this fake and shallow rendering. Okay, you guys, I hope that's helpful. Not a ton of material on the first exam, but stuff that we should know. If you have any questions while you're taking the exam or uh, studying, please uh, fire me an email, let me know, and I'm happy to answer them. Okay, good luck in there, you guys.